Hello, everybody. This is Rebecca Freedom, and this is episode number 63 of Heard Not Seen, produced by John Beethan. And today we're doing it again. We're having a very special guest on, Amy Turner, and we're going to talk about all sorts of things today um, about her work in the world, which is extraordinary, about sex, drugs, love, and rock and roll, all the fun things. And uh, maybe some not fun things like personal trauma, how to heal that. And then uh, I'm just going to be nosy about our life. So welcome, Amy. Thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. We're popping a cherry today. This is her first podcast ever. So yay for yay for that. Thanks for being on. I'm a virgin, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> like a virgin. Podcasting for the very first time. So um, when it comes to you and your work, let's start, let's like dive in there because I met you a couple months ago and you had this little stand that said no BS therapy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, that's ballsy. (laughs) (laughs) So tell us, tell us about the no BS therapy and, and what it is and how it came to be. Yeah. So it came to be because, um, at first I've done a lot of personal growth on myself for five years intense. And I finally decided I've been living my life with so many BS stories. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to start making YouTube videos of my BS stories and start calling them out. The story of I'm not enough, that I need to compare myself, putting people on pedestals. And that just kind of gave me some ammo. And then when I switched over, I switched from being a therapist to a coach. I was like, okay, well, what does this look like? And I found this method that I use. It's called rapid transformational therapy. And it's pretty much no BS. So in two hours, I can help people find their limiting belief, the root cause of where it comes from, and to release it. Mm -hmm. And being a psychotherapist for seven years, I couldn't do that in years with clients. And so now that it actually works, and then I can see that it works, and it's like, well, this is no BS. You don't have to sit on a couch for years and years like everyone tells you you have to. You can come see me for that two hours, and you're going to get it's almost like three years of intense therapy in a two hour session. You're like human ayahuasca. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, people, you don't have to purge. <laughs> you just, you don't have to, you, you don't have to throw up to be able to, to see the light to really, and, and beyond that, and because I've done a lot of, we've done, that's kind of continuation of some of the podcasts we've done before talking about, plant medicine mm. um, as true medicine and plant medicine as people are still running for using it in an abusive way. Mm. And um, so in your work, do you feel that it, that people could try it, but still not get to the point or do you feel like it's effective and there's, there's no hiding? Well, I love that you brought up the plant medicine Mm -hmm. because when I first learned this method, I actually thought that Mm -hmm. because I've done ayahuasca too. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, oh my gosh, it's like ayahuasca, Mm -hmm. but you don't have to purge. So Mm -hmm. I love that you just shared that. But it works if you want it to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, our mind, we, our mind can take over so much. And so if we tell ourselves it's not going to work, then it's not going to work. So I have had, I had one client where she was just so hard on herself and just so wanting to be in control that I couldn't, we we couldn't go where we needed to go because she couldn't let loose. But everyone else, if you really want it and if you let go, then it will work and it will work miraculously. Mm -hmm. I was having a conversation because I also was a trained psychotherapist and um, I still am like, don't call me a coach. Just, just <laughs> you, I'd rather, as I've been saying lately, I'd rather be called a witch than a coach. Um, so, so when it comes to that, I, I recently had the awareness that I was like, oh, well, it's not my trauma. It's our collective trauma. There's maybe a specific event that happened to you and to your body, to your mind, to your spirit, to that that thing. And that becomes the story, right? Like I was neglected. I was molested. I had this thing happen to me. Um, and, and that, 
often creates quite a bit of pain in people's lives. So do you feel like that's when you see people come to you is when they're most in pain or, or do you see, oh, well, I'll just ask that and then we'll go to the second question. Yeah, it's, I think the people who decide that they absolutely want to work with me are in so much pain Mm -hmm. and they've like, I've tried years of therapy. A lot of my clients were in therapy when they were kids Mm -hmm. and it was because the parents were the ones damaging them, but they couldn't take responsibility. And so the kids had to be the one in therapy. And so they come to me. I've been in therapy for many years. I've tried everything. I've tried acupuncture. I've tried chiropractor. I mean, every different type of modality, energy healing, shamanism, so many different things. And then they come to me and they are shocked at how quickly Mm -hmm. it works. Mm -hmm. And you said there, is there a blend of hypnotism in it or there is, is Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, there's, it's some, it's funny how some of the most, um, practiced modalities have been around the longest, like we kind of return to them and, mm. you know, so we say like, there is that sense of like, oh, well, wear quartz crystal around my neck and I'll buy these essential oils and I'll go to dance therapy and I'll, do plant medicine and, or, and I'll run and yet, yet there's still the shadow or I still date the same guys or I still am in my life. Isn't moving forward. I'm still financially locked. And so you're saying that with this particular modality again and say what its name it is rapid transformational therapy. I mean, name says it all, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, Ooh, I wonder if it's going to work quickly. Rapid. <laughs> transformational therapy. So on a different level, like on a sort of meta level, how has being a practitioner of rapid transfa- transformational therapy changed your life specifically? Oh my gosh, it's changed my mo- my life so much because I was getting so fed up being a psychotherapist. I mean, you were too. And it's just like, you're listening to the people say their story over and over and over again. And they're wanting that relief. They're wanting their results, but they're not getting them. And it's frustrating for the client. It's frustrating for the therapist because we just keep hearing the same thing over and over. And actually, when I found this method, I was a complete skeptic. Mm -hmm. The woman who created it, Marissa Peer, she said that she can cure anyone in one session. And so first of all, that was like a red flag for me because mm-hmm. we can't say the word cure mm-hmm. in America because mm-hmm. she's from England. Ah. And so when I heard that, I was like, who is this crazy lady? <laughs> who is this lady that thinks you can cure people in two hours? I'm like, I want to know more about this. And my whole point was, okay, I'm going to take her course. I'm going to prove her wrong and I'm going to get my money back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then when I started practicing her tools, which are really good and I haven't heard of things like that. And I started practicing them on coworkers and friends and every single person had a breakthrough. Mm. And some of my coworkers, I didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't either. And they were crying with me. And of course, I will always keep that confidential. But mm-hmm. I, we were both shocked at how transformational it actually was. And then for me, I was like, thank God I finally found something. I found a purpose. I found my reason of why I'm here because I don't want to just listen to that person's story over and over and not have them get results. I want them to actually get results. Mm-hmm. And this does it. And and the other piece of it too is as you're going through the training, you're practicing with other practitioners. And so I had two or three other people practice on me. And it took my therapist maybe three years to get me to cry. And when I was doing a session with them, I was crying and I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this? (laughs) Mm -hmm. I can't believe I'm crying. And I healed some of my wounds that I still haven't been able to heal in my own therapy. And so seeing it from my own perspective and seeing it from my client's perspective, there's something to this. And I was thankful because now I don't have to be a psychotherapist anymore. I can, I hate that word coach too. I don't Mm -hmm. know what else to call myself, but Mm -hmm. I can go into the coaching Mm -hmm. and do it and Mm -hmm. actually get them results and me actually make a good living too. Mm -hmm. So that, that's another, again, um, just an invitation as people listen to this is there's obviously so many, um, people, there's different strokes for different folks, right? So I love what you said that you, you have to be, you want to have to want it, 
for this modality to really work. And that's, that's true of a lot of things. I studied the placebo effect in undergrad. I did my um, thesis on it. And the mind is super powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, so to the point of something you said, like, and making good money at it, because that's, that's another, um, I think, meta point for people who are also practitioners, because we're not dismissing crystal therapy or massage or acupuncture. Those are all beautiful and amazing things. Those are actually, and they really like, and again, for me, 12, this 12 step program hits me differently than other modalities I've, I've tried. So there's, there's lots of things available to people, but there's another set of people listening right now that are the practitioners of like psychotherapists and everything else that, uh, that are not making good money. So maybe we switch gears into like the business kind of conversation around things. And if you're willing to kind of share your, your business story around stepping into no BS therapy. Sure. Yeah. That was, that was a scary transition for me because working as a psychotherapist, our legal board is called the BBS and it's like you, you're you scared all the time of the BBS above your head. And it's like, I can't do anything wrong or I'm going to get my license taken away. I'm going to go to jail and pay all these big fines. And of course, you're not going to. If you're an ethical person that knows boundaries, then you're fine. But mm-hmm. still, they, they put that fear in you. And so me, even, even naming my business No BS Therapy, but doing it more from a coaching aspect was scary for me because... Oh my gosh, can I not call myself? Can I not say therapy in my name if I'm not going to be following my license? So there was a lot of a lot of fear there. Um the best thing for me is when I was transitioning, I just reached out on Facebook into a local community and I said, Hey, are there any other therapists in here that have gone into coaching? I'd love to get on a call with you. And that was so helpful because I got to see how other people did it. And a lot of the um, people that I spoke with, they said that they're still doing both. Mm -hmm. And the more I learned about coaching and I got my own coach and I realized how you can really be successful in it, I was like, I don't want to be a therapist anymore. Mm -hmm. I just want to do it from that coaching aspect. Mm -hmm. Well, I can speak to one of the business aspects just fundamentally of Um, being a psychotherapist is you typically charge, you're doing one-on-one therapy and you charge per session. Yes. And, uh, and, you know, sliding scale and there's, there's sometimes ACA ethics around how you charge um, or who you work with. And if you work with an individual that's part of a couple, you can't necessarily switch into treating the couple unless there's like all this agreement change. And there's a lot of rules to abide by. And I, the coaching aspect is people would sell packages more so, right? Like I need a three month commitment. I need a two month commitment. And that, that can change how you scale your business. And then there's the other aspect that um, psychotherapists are kind of prohibited is um, above over state lines doing um, teletherapy, unless there's like, uh, I know that that's starting to change as well, but that's part of being able to scale is offering webinars and doing different things like that. So, but then getting clients is a whole other, the marketing kind of component, right? So the people that find you and and feed in. So uh, maybe you can talk, because I have my own style, but maybe you can talk into your marketing component of bringing people or kind of attracting people. What do you feel like is working? I would say right now what's working is just being authentic Mm -hmm. and, and my business name, everyone loves it. They're like, Amy, I love your (laughs) business name. And if people don't like it, it gets them to look at it, Mm -hmm. you know? And then I've had people that say when I'm speaking, oh, make sure you don't cuss because you don't want to piss off Mm -hmm. another person in the audience. And I'm like, well, that's not me. Mm -hmm. They, if, if they want to learn from me, they're going to have to accept me for me. Mm -hmm. And so I would say just just being who I am and being authentic and really caring. There's one thing that I'm noticing in the coaching space that, you know, to each their own, however it works for them, mm-hmm. and maybe it's because of my therapy background, but in this coaching group I'm in, someone shared 
that someone asked, oh, how long are your discovery calls? I mean, that's what coaches call their stupid sales calls, actually. But they call them all these discovery calls and all these like fancy unicorn type names. (laughs) Fuck you guys. No, I'm just kidding. Love you. Love you. (laughs) No, I love it. It's just really funny because I'm like, no BS. Yeah. It's like, why do we have to call them these fancy names? Just call them. We're going to take your money and make your life better. We'll just get get with the program. Sign here on the dotted line. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, so what I'm noticing is people were saying like, oh, my calls are like 20 minutes max. If I'll know for a fact if they're my client in 20 minutes. It's like, oh my gosh, how can you know that? How can you like hear their story and hear their issues and what and know that you can help them in 20 minutes? And so for me, I think my biggest marketing is once I get them on the phone, they actually feel heard mm. and they feel safe mm-hmm. and they know that I care about them and that I'm going to be there with them all the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, we're in, so this is another conversation I had today that I was just like, this is a... um White Hot Truth is by Danielle Laporte, and I've not read it, but the essence of it is that sometimes we are, sometimes our spirituality is green juice and spin class. Sometimes our spirituality is um, doing kirtan. Sometimes it's doing silent retreat. There's all different ways, but she's like, there's this part of us in Western society because we're such about, we're so about the hustle that we can take self development and bludgeon ourselves over the head, right? Just like you said, going to all these different modalities and and healers to fix ourselves. And so I was like, what I see is this, this general fork sort of happening within the um, conscious communities, the the self-development sphere is there is, there is still the self-help self turned into self-help is now self-development because it's developed (laughs) <laughs> out of the 90s into something else. And so there's a self-development aisle going. And then there's a the practitioners, I think, that are aligning with connection and remembering. So like the Wizard of Oz people that are like, it was in you all along. I just helped facilitate that remembering. And then the self-development people, they're like, what are your goals? How do you set your goals? You know, that, that Whatever. So um, that's what I'm sort of seeing in the field is those kind of two different areas of people that are like um, more about just remember the powers inside of you and facilitating that, you know, the remembering piece. And then, and not that one is better than, not that there's anything wrong with that. Not that one is better than the other. Um, they're just sort of like different genres. So when you kind of feel into um, the no BS therapy, what do you feel like it's more self-development, more like remembering or something else? I would say that I kind of fall in more of that. If I'm following you correctly, the self-development where, you know, I I'm seeing that, like you said, some people say like everyone has the answers and Mm -hmm. I absolutely believe that. But if they had the answers in that moment, Mm -hmm. would they need us? Mm -hmm. So I think there's some, coaches or therapists or practitioners out there that can never actually give feedback or give them their opinion because, oh, they need to figure it out. It's their own thing. But I'm like, well, they're paying you Mm -hmm. to figure it out. So I'm, that's my no BS, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, okay, you're telling me I'm, I'm going to give you a suggestion. You don't have to take it, but this is what I'm seeing. Mm -hmm. So I think my clients like that Mm -hmm. because then they're getting unstuck and they're seeing it from a different perspective. And I'm absolutely about if they don't like what I say, or if they don't agree, Mm -hmm. then they tell me, I'm like, okay, cool. Let's try on something else. But I know that the answers are in them, but sometimes they need that little push to be facilitated. So my curiosity from after you've been in the work and done this for a long time is what is trauma? What is trauma? Okay. So this is a big one. A lot of people think that trauma is just, oh, if I was beat or sexually abused as a kid, that's trauma. It is, Mm -hmm. but there's so much more. There's so much that goes on, little things that is traumatic that can really impair us as adults that we, we didn't think did. Like, for example, when I was working in a hospital, I worked with a lot of uh, 
I don't like saying addicts and alcoholics. So people with problems with addiction and alcohol. And sometimes people would say, oh, my childhood was great. It was a great childhood. And I'm like, okay, so you weren't abused and you weren't sexually abused, but something happened. And so as long as the person was willing to trust me and let me find out more about what happened is it can be just not getting your needs met in the way that you needed a met. It could be your parent is having three different jobs Mm -hmm. single, you know, and they can't give the, their kid the attention that they need. And so the kid grows up thinking something's wrong with him or her. And so that can be traumatic. And so many people too think like, oh, well, I didn't have an abusive childhood or I didn't have sexual molestation. So and that person did. So they, they need the help, not me they're the ones that experienced it. It still hurt them. And so everyone can can use that help to see, okay, what happened to where they don't think that they're enough? They they feel like they're limited. There's something that happened or a series of things that happened, but it doesn't mean that they had to have been abused or sexually molested for that. Yeah, there, so there can be cumulative events that, that then sort of what I'm hearing you say is like equal, uh, tra- um, like overall trauma because there's, you know, cumulative coping mechanisms that come up around that. And then, but we're a lot of times psychotherapy has been more focused on the acute events, like the, the car wreck or, um, boundary violations or a really clear cut kind of things that have created what we would call, um, trauma. So again, conversation from earlier today about, when an injury happens, and that can be like a parent working too much and not really guiding the kid, and, and then you see their attachment styles change. When an injury happens, we lose a part of ourselves, I think, and a coping mechanism gets put in place, whatever that might be, you know, and then that's what we have sort of access to. So I'm imagining part of what you do is you help people retrace what their coping mechanisms were that got put in place um, to some degree. Would you say that's true? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Especially, you know, one, one coping mechanism is laughing at everything and being the class clown. And, you know, I have a client like that. And when we look deeper at it, it's because there's so much pain there because of his father and the way that his father treated him, that he just, the only way he could not deal with the pain and just, and, and just be okay with it is he just had to laugh about it and became the class clown. Mm -hmm. But, and so he's the, the funny one that everyone just loves being around, but he's in so much pain inside. It's just such a true story for all of us, right? Like I've, I've put myself on blast plenty on here. So I'm going to back off that today for a little bit, but to say like, uh, my other question for you is what do you think healthy relationship is? <laughs> oh, that's a hard one. Uh, do, do, do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Okay. Healthy relationship. Well, it's not easy to have a healthy relationship and that's why I'm saying it's hard because a lot of us have this history that we come from where we didn't feel like we're enough and we didn't feel we're worthy or valuable. And so when we are in a relationship and we don't feel like that person thinks we're valuable or is honoring us, then we can immediately go back to that little girl or that little boy and react. Mm -hmm. So I would say a healthy relationship is as soon as you notice that you're reacting, stop and take responsibility because, you know, some people say like, oh, okay, for in this relationship, one partner needs to take 50% and the other one needs to take 50%. No, each partner needs to take 100%. Of the resp- being able to come from that responsible place. And, um, and what do you, I mean, as far as, so we're going to, we're going to get nosy now. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> I don't think she's ready. Uh. (laughs) So when it comes to like your dating life, have you been married and divorced? Have, I mean, what does the landscape look like? Right now I'm in a relationship. I've been with him for seven months. 
But before that, I was single for seven years. Mm -hmm. So I was dating around and on every single Tinder and Bumble. And it was just ridiculous how many dates I was going on. But it was interesting because I realized in the moment, even though I wanted to be in a relationship so incredibly badly, is looking back now, I wasn't ready. If I got into a relationship during those seven years, it wouldn't have worked out because I needed to do so much work on myself to understand what a healthy relationship looks like. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that growing up. And so I didn't know what it looked like. I was very much the codependent needy person that would make myself like a chameleon to whatever the guy wanted. And so I had to learn, no, I'm powerful. I have opinions. I matter. And that's when I was able to finally attract this amazing man where it's, it's crazy, our communication, because I never used to stand up for myself. I never used to talk about problems. I used to just run and hide. And immediately when we have a problem, we'll talk about it. Mm -hmm. And his big thing is we're not going to go to bed angry. And that's biblical. There's like, don't let the sun set down on your anger. So you guys are marching to an old drum. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. And then, um, and I'm with you, like my, my parents, like I definitely learned the code of mart martyrdom from my mom and my dad just, um, was all over the map too. So it's not like I had this great relational example growing up and, um, it's only taken, you know, a dozen breakups for me to be like, mm, maybe I'm valuable. <laughs> like maybe she can. And then I heard today this really great analogy from this guy, Derek Jackson, that we, we put on last week's um, podcast too. just mentioned him is that he's like, Oh, just imagine this ladies. He's like, after a breakup, remember who the fuck you are. First of all, start there. He's like, you were there trying to hold your man down, be his spine, keep him in check. And he was like, <laughs> whatever. And there's, you know, chasing some other tail. He's like, now imagine you as a million dollars, you have a million dollars and you go to somebody who's broke and you say, Hey, I have this million dollars to give you. And they're like, I'm just not ready for a million dollars right now. It's, it's a bad time <laughs> for me. Or like, you know, you try and control me with that million dollars <laughs> <You know? laughs> or whatever. And, and just all the moments or, you know, I'm sorry, boo, that like $20 over there looks way better than your million dollars. There's just too much shine there. <laughs> and so it's a really, it's a really interesting episode. Do you, so when you say you feel like you attracted somebody, do you feel like that was the point you hit? I'm valuable. And you started to like, get it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, yeah, I, I started to finally, cause I was all about like, I need to go on dates. I need to find a guy. And that was just who I was becoming. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to stay on this dating site because I'm putting it in the universe and I'm ready to find a relationship. But I, I wasn't that needy person anymore. Mm -hmm. I was just like, okay, he's coming when he's com coming, but I'm fine right now. And that's right when I was starting to build my business. So I didn't really have time to date either because I was like taking every single webinar I could take, talking to everyone I could about how to transition from therapy to coaching and getting my own coach and working on that. And so I was so incredibly busy that I didn't have time, but I still put myself out there. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I talk to people because this is a familiar story that we it's 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 sort of in the consciousness that we go through where and um, um, kind of punctuate around this where yesterday I said loneliness and this is going to be my TED talk. So copyright Rebecca Freedom freaking 2017. Don't steal this people. I'm only going to give you a little snippet <laughs> <laughs> and then and then you can layer on top of it, Amy. It's like loneliness is generally the time that we start swiping or being like, I just want a relationship so bad. Oh my God, where's my family at? Or, or there's people who've been divorced and, you know, there's lots of baggage. There's lots of different stories, but you, but the story of being lonely, like disappointed, devastated, uncomfortable with your own company is a familiar story in being lonely and I know that that's the time people start to want to move someone into their personal space. 
So when you say you weren't ready, is that sort of what you were talking about? Like you weren't ready to actually have somebody like co-create with you, be in your personal space and like it wouldn't have worked out because. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was lonely cause I was that needy person and I wouldn't in that neediness and in that loneliness, I wouldn't, if I was in a relationship, it wouldn't have lasted because either he wouldn't have given me the time of day or I would have been too needy that I would have pushed him away. And so, yeah, I just know looking back now, I know that it wouldn't have lasted, but in that moment, Oh my gosh, I was screaming at my therapist every single week Mm -hmm. telling her, no, I'm ready for a relationship. And she's like, no, you're not. And I'm like, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's, and we'll puncture. That's a huge point of readiness. Like readiness is is not my will, but your will be done. Surrender to your higher power. God's timing is not our timing, but it, and, and, um, again, no weapon formed against you will move. Like you can't, you can't force it. You can't force it. I mean, you can try. <laughs> and it sounds like both you and I have tried. We're like, now, now, now is the time, but there is, there is something, a bigger plan and purpose, I think for all of us. So, because people are walking this path, desperately wanting relationship, having tried different modalities and really trying to dig down to that healing place and just like feel what you're feeling probably valuable to like feel valued and, and not this external I'm valued, you know, like that's internal knowing that comes with this. Um, can you tell people if they really want to try uh, the rapid transformational therapy, how to find you and how to reach out to you. Yeah. So you can find me on my website, www.nobstherapy.com. You can also email me at nobstherapist at gmail.com. It's amazing. You got those URLs. That's just badass. <laughs> so <clears throat> again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Please leave your comments below and you know, there is, there is a way to break through our collective addictions, our collective trauma, and uh, to be who you're meant to be and walk your path. I am here to help with that as well. You can reach out to me at RebeccaFreedom.com. That's R-E-B-E-K-A-H Freedom.com, offering you psychic insights and more. And all of you out there, read the show notes that John has so beautifully curated. Thank you again for listening. Be set free.